We'll call this meeting to order. It's a just regular workshop meeting. Uh, Council, you have uh, in front of your places there a copy of the agenda for tonight's proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. And uh, I would entertain at this time a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Harry, not all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? All right, we have one topic on here, and this is the Sturgeon City Environmental and Educational Center. Dr. Woodruff, I'm going to turn it over to you this time to open. Mayor, members of council, thank you very much for coming out tonight. You know, when you have an event in the community such as we had this past Friday night, which uh, recognized the POW MAI MIA, uh, it's always important to take a moment to thank the people, in this case, Rolling Thunder, for the work that they did to put that on. I know uh, several of you were able to attend. I think overall there were probably four or 500 citizens who were there. We are very fortunate that we live in a community that continues to show the care that we as a community have for the military. Part of being a caring community is also addressing some very difficult choices when it comes to community progress. And tonight we're gonna continue a discussion that began on June 21st regarding the Sturgeon City uh, building. We're going to do this in a series of presentations, and as you can see in the format, there's going to be some quick reminders of the 21st meeting. We're then going to relinquish this part of the table to the Sturgeon City Board and, their, uh, and our architect to discuss the building and cost and so forth. Then we're going to provide more uh, information on things you have requested. I'm going to give you some recommendations. And then the real difficult part comes down, and that's for y'all to, to decide how do we move forward as a community. The first thing I think that's positive about this is that everybody who's involved in this is here for the right reason. You know, we all want Jacksonville to move forward. And what we have to figure out is, given our resources and given our opportunities, how do we move forward together? And I'm confident that through the meeting tonight or subsequent meetings, we'll eventually find our way. The important thing in a community moving forward with progress is that we are at least looking on how we move forward. We may agree or disagree on the specific steps on how you move forward, but the key is we're not discussing, uh, you know, going backwards. We're discussing what's the future, and that's really an important thing. Very, very quickly, you will recall that in 2012, we issued bonds for three projects, roughly $29 million. $25 million was spent on the Center for Public Safety and Fire T Station 2. Roughly $4 million was set aside for the potential building at Sturgeon City. You'll remember it's a 20-year debt. It was issued in 2012. It'll go through 032. In 032, I will be 32 years old. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So I'm looking forward to that date. The $25 million is fully paid by the city. The $4 million is a combination payment. And you'll remember this slide that Sturgeon City Nonprofit, the Tourist Development Authority of the City of Jacksonville, and the city each contribute to the current approximately $300,000 annual payment. You will also recall that of the $4 million that's in the project, roughly 3.7 is current balance. And again, the, the payments. I apologize, I hit that too fast. Four payments have been made by Sturgeon City, the TDA, and the city. So whatever decisions we make, we must also keep in mind the amount of money that's available, but also the payments that other agencies have made. We showed you six options with pros and cons, and there were financial and programmatic issues. Very quickly, option one was to build as designed. Option two was reduce the size. John Sawyer is going to show you some additional pictures on that. You'll recall that we showed you pros and cons of the options. We also showed you pros and cons of the build on Onslow Insight. And we talked about no construction and simply pay down the debt and the pros and cons of that. We talked about an option of building classrooms at Sturgeon City instead of building the center itself. And again, we showed you the pros and cons there. Another option relative to the classroom space was uh, this information, which showed you the rough uh, information on what it would cost to operate. And then the sixth option, which we talked about back in June, was to simply 
direct the bonds to fund some other project. Don't build anything at Sturgeon City, but build some other projects and, you know, direct the money that way, and we showed you the pros and cons. Before we turn it over to Sturgeon City, does anyone have any questions to clarify what the six options that you saw roughly two months ago, what those six options were? Was there one that where we just paid down the debt? Can yes, sir. Okay, one. Uh, one was, I believe it was option four. Okay. okay. Uh, no construction, pay down the debt. And you saw the pros of that and the cons also. And then, of course, option five was classrooms with their pros and cons. <clears throat> and option six was to direct it to some other community project. The Sturgeon City nonprofit has prepared uh, what I think is a very educational presentation. I'd like to ask their members to step up, and because there are several of them involved, I will step back. And then after their presentation, I have some additional thoughts and recommendations to give you. But at this time, I'd like to yield the floor to Dr. Don and his group. Dr. Heron? Let me help you with your seat. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good evening, members of the council. Uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to meet and to be a part of discussion tonight. And to Dr. Woodruff, thank you for the opportunity to renew our continued dialogue in support of initiatives to support Sturgeon City there. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'd like to also at this time introduce the members of our board who are present here tonight. I have the pleasure of serving as chair of this committee. I'd like tonight to also introduce uh, Mr. Charles Eford. Mr. Charles Eford serves as our vice chair and also is our chairman of our fund development campaign for Sturgeon City. Tonight, uh, to my left, I have Mr. Gary Danford. Also to my left, I have Mr. John Rouse. Uh, in addition, in our uh, room tonight, we have Mr. Ken Agin, who's a member of our board. Also, Ms. Tiffany Choice, a member of our board. And also, Ms. Paula Fernell, who is our director of uh, development and operations at the, at the uh, Sturgeon City site there. Um, on behalf of the board there, I appreciate the opportunity to start the conversation tonight here. I've been a part of this uh, organization and the initiatives since 1999. So I have witnessed almost every meeting of the council and the council initiatives, uh, from the first initiative about talking about developing this project here, from the uh, original uh, initiative where the board, the city council served as the initial board for Sturgeon City, the time in which that board transferred that authority over to a nonprofit, uh, the development and redevelopment of a master plan uh, for Sturgeon City, and most importantly, March 6 of 2012, where we secured the approval, our board secured the approval of the council uh, to support a $4 million financing package where the Sturgeon City nonprofit would assume $1 million of debt and that we would agree to finance that debt uh, through repayments from the Sturgeon City nonprofit. Uh, since 2012, uh, we've <coughs> continued to transition there. Uh, we've secured the services of uh, uh, John Sawyer, who will uh, tonight give you an update on the building, who's helped us from the concept to development to the redevelopment of this building, and he'll give an overview of that tonight. We've also been able to establish a very successful campaign committee. Uh, Mr. Charles Eford has done a phenomenal job of uh, uh, bringing people together and, and beating, uh, the, meeting the enthusiasm of people and, and getting that going there. Uh, we've created untold partnerships, uh, both local, regional, and statewide there. Uh, our local partners there have been very supportive. Uh, special thanks to our uh, Jacksonville Tourist Development Authority there for their support of this project and ongoing support of the Sturgeon City Initiative there. We've been able to secure funding from such areas as Golden Leaf, uh, the Golden Leaf Foundation, where those funds have helped us in some initial design and helping to offset those costs there. Uh, since uh, 2012, we've been able to make, successfully make on time our four $75,000 payments, as was outlined in the initial, initial um, uh, project from 2012 there. Uh, we've been able to even secure interest and support from our legislators and Department of Transportation for some upcoming paving there to support that project. Um, and most importantly, I'd like to thank our staff since 2012 who've done a phenomenal job in engaging our community, engaging our students and our educators there. Uh, just last year for our 2015-2016 
initiatives there, all the Sturgeon City initiatives there. Uh, we've been able to serve over 8,000 individuals. That's, uh, that's children, that's uh, school students, that's adults who've come by, that's uh, us taking our Sturgeon City on the road to our areas here and, and continue to do education and support. To continue supporting the mission of educational, um, environmental education and uh, civic education and environmental stewardship here in our community here. Uh, these past four years since 2012 have been a challenge to all of us here. Uh, all of the um, work that's had to occur, all of the um, uh, time that we've spent in waiting, uh, working with North Carolina Division of Environmental Quality, but that's, that's been a challenge. That's been a challenge uh, to the elected council here because you've, you've taken initiatives to help get things going there. Uh, you've invested your political capital to help Sturgeon City go forward, and it's sad. It's been a challenge to our city manager. Our manager has uh, tried to keep everybody informed and keep everybody updated and to get this initiative moving. Uh, I applaud the efforts of the city uh, to engage necessary council to continue helping us get this moving and to begin getting response back. And most, it's also been a challenge to our nonprofit board because like anything else, it starts momentum and then something that um, you, you can't promise what you can't deliver and so the four years that we've been involved with the uh, North Carolina Water Quality Council there or that Council of Environmental uh, Efforts there that has been a challenge to all of us here. I do want to extend the appreciation of everybody around this table tonight for what we're about to talk about for what we're working with here but extend the appreciation for the numerous partnerships that have been involved along the way to get us to this point of where we are and where we hope to go here. Uh, in short, tonight, uh, this evening, we bring you an update from our nonprofit board, which first is a unanimous commitment to the success of this project. Uh, from the very start, our board has been unanimous in coming before you and seeking your, uh, your support to make this project successful. And most importantly tonight, we're seeking, uh, we're bringing you a unanimous support from our board uh, when, to continue seeking the council's support to proceed with this plan to build a facility <coughs> as it is currently designed. Uh, tonight, I think to give us the best insight of where we are and where we want to go with this building, I'd like to introduce this time, who needs no introduction, Mr. John Sawyer. Uh, and I'm going to pass that down. And John, if you want to come take this seat to be a little closer to the action, I will yield that. I, I'm fine. Okay, yes, sir. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction. I, I have been involved in this project since, gosh, 2012, <laughs> maybe even 2011. Um, our design that we proposed follows a master plan, a, a well-done master plan that actually lays out a future for Sturgeon City. The project we've designed is sort of an, an initial piece of that. And uh, it is not just a building. It is uh, parking facilities. It is landscaping. It is a facility that kind of forms the gateway to uh, all of the existing structures that are there and helps uh, Sturgeon City meet its mission, meet its goal of environmental education. Um, we, um, let's see. we are currently, uh, we have completed uh, plans and specifications. Uh, they are 100% complete. This is a specification. Uh, and the plans, permits are, uh, have all been applied for. They have, plans have been reviewed. Uh, we know of no obstacle to receiving building permits for this. Even the uh, Diener uh, review <coughs> and the discovery of the monitoring well on the site has finally shaken out to involving the one lower piece of the parking lot. It doesn't preclude us from paving that. It does put some restriction on uh, what, how we landscape it. It does not affect the building. We've been told that that uh, investigation, that determination, doesn't stop this project from being built. Um, that is finally resolved, and that's, that has been a very frustrating process to try to get there. So uh, we know that what, what we have drawn and specified is buildable, can be permitted. Uh, it, is our, it has been through the city planning department. Uh, all of that, a lot of that happened actually in 2013. To give you a little history, just before the discovery of this monitoring well, we were weeks, 
like two weeks away from advertising and putting the job out for bids. The documents <coughs> were complete. All the permitting and reviews had been done. Uh, we were that close. Uh, we also had, um, uh, through our work in designing the building, we do cost <laughs> estimates periodically, and we had a we have a consultant who who uh, is a professional cost estimator. We like to use him because he's he doesn't get enamored with the project. He doesn't make up numbers to make things work. He gives us the hard facts. He performed cost estimating throughout the project. His last estimate that he gave us before we completed the drawing showed that we were slightly over budget. Um, by slightly on a you know, $4 million project, I'm talking about we were over budget by $400,000. And so we took action back in 2013 to reduce cost to get the project back within budget before it went out for bid. Um, one of the things, uh, <coughs> some of the things we did are we, uh, I've called them, th now I'm calling them value engineering because I think that has a meaning to most <coughs> people, but these are changes that we made and most of them are already in these plans and in the specification to reduce costs to get the project within within budget. Um, some of the things are ads because the cost estimator missed them in, in his takeoff. Uh, we, there are a few gutters and downspouts that he missed. We changed the metal siding system on the building to a less expensive siding method, a method that we've been using now through three or four projects. It works well and it saves a significant amount of money. We identified that as an area to save money on because of his <coughs> estimating. We realized how much of the total construction cost was going into the metal siding. Structural steel, we were able to reduce those costs by, uh, for example, there's an exterior canopy, uh, covered area over the, over the courtyard space for shade in the summer. <coughs> we revised that uh, and found a way to have that <coughs> built as a canopy, it's a prefabricated unit instead of custom building it out of structural steel. We saved a significant amount uh, of that in, in reducing the structural steel cost. Some of that is also in the soffits and canopy cost. The site lighting, we're talking about leasing that now from Duke Energy, not owning it. Uh, the wall framing revisions, we found that we could revise the way some of the stud framing was, was done. and. All of these, we worked with our structural engineer and we worked with the cost estimator to make sure that we were actually saving these dollars. Um, the next item, which is a big ticket item, is deleting the skyfold walls we had in the project, walls that instead of folding to the side like this wall does, they retracted upward. They're very elegant things, but they are expensive. and. Uh, we uh, we found that we can accomplish the same thing with folding walls that move side to side, and so we deducted the skyfold walls <laughs> at $279,000 and added back in the horizontal sliding walls at $113,000. And then finally, the, the cost estimate did not have an allowance in it for the aquarium, which was a big part of the design of the project uh, in the lobby space, so we added that number. But you see the subtotal is even in 2013, we had knocked $408,000 out of the project, and we had, with the approval of the building committee, we had put in alternate bids to let us control cost even more after bid day by <coughs> eliminating one folding wall, for example, was one of our alternate bids. We had a few others that would give us more control to, to get the, make sure the project was within budget. So where we are now is we, we had the cost estimate from our cost estimator, Mulford Cost Management. It started at uh, $3,273,000. With the $408,000 uh, $408, deduction, we got it down to 
two million eight forty five. Um, on the site work, we went through the same kind of process. We found locations where we could where we could save uh, some money uh, throughout the site work cost. Moved moving that down so that it went from $689,000 to $613,000. Uh, by the way, the site work on this project is a significant chunk of the budget. It, it is because, it, frankly, it needs to be. It is, it is providing a lot of, of uh, it's doing a lot of work to get the site uh, set up to become kind of the gateway into Sturgeon City. The bottom line uh, construction cost uh, estimate when when we were ready to put this out for bid was three million four seventy eight four seventy nine when you when you take all those numbers into consideration and then you add in the escalation that's happened because it's been three years since we did all of that since we got to this point our cost estimators advised us that we need to figure on ten percent uh, roughly having to, account, to handle the escalation that's happened on the project over the last three years. So when we add that in, um, we add in the, the fees that remain in our design contract because you know, the project stopped and we stopped and we still have to go through construction and bidding. You put in funds for contingencies, uh, administrative cost, furniture and equipment is a separate budget by Sturgeon City. They have a separate fund for that. It gives us a bottom line number of uh, right now, considering it inflation, excuse me, considering escalation that's happened, we're at 4,205. So we're still over budget. But it's, we think there are opportunities in the project to cut some more cost without affecting how the building feels or how it works. One of the things we we did in designing the building is this sort of illustrated by this slide. This is a slide where we did a daylighting study within the building, within the main room. Um, you know, at, uh, in the morning, noon, 3 p.m., in the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter. That's a, that's a an actual model, physical model we built. We got it out in the sun. We photographed the interior just to make sure we were getting good daylighting in the space. Because that's part of what Sturgeon City's whole MO is. It's environmental. So the building is designed <coughs> to take advantage of daylighting to be a very functional plan. Um, one of the things that happens in this drawing is you can see the box downs in the slide and I put a dimension of 16 feet from the bottom of one of those of the box down to the floor. That box down is for the skyfold wall. When we change to something other than the skyfold wall and we remove we don't need that box anymore then we have a ceiling height in this space of, of 21 feet. A 21 foot tall ceiling in this space is excessive we can accomplish the same thing in the project with, with a lower structure height. This is an example. This is a project we completed six years ago. This is, that meeting room is 75 feet by 70 feet. The space at Sturgeon City is only 50 feet wide, but it is 120 feet long. But that ceiling height is 17 feet, six inches. The space is very popular. It's used constantly. It's been a very successful facility. So what I would like to do is I think I would like to explore lowering the height of the main room at Sturgeon City, take advantage of, of the fact that when we remove the skyfold walls, we don't need that much height to get a room that feels great. Lower that height and capture the savings that will happen with structural steel, wall framing, um, 
there are a lot of things, HVAC, a lot of things will, will happen that can help us save some more money and hopefully get even closer to our budget. I think we're so close because um, now I believe we are within $500,000 of being, we're that close to the funding that is available now to be able to award this project and build it. And uh, I, you know, I think we have an opportunity to, with that decision on the scaffold walls, to recoup some more money and get this project uh, within the funds that are available. So, um, these are the estimates um, as designed with, but that's without any of these, um, any of these um, value engineering options. We're looking at a shortfall of over a million dollars. The second column is with the value engineering options. We, we've, I've just described we're within approximately $500,000 of being within the funding that's available. And the, the third column is the idea of reducing the building size, cutting out a bay of it, of the large room and some other spaces. And if we did that, we would be, uh, we would actually be a little under budget. The problem with reducing the size is we then, we are affecting how many people were affecting the capacity of the building when you reduce the size. With all the VE items we've suggested, they're hidden things. They don't affect performance. They don't affect function. And they don't affect the capacity of the building. Um, these, this slide just illustrates what, you know, we've done furniture layouts uh, in the building, uh, banquet tables with eight per table, which is, a, uh, I'm told by the Hilton and other facilities the convention center in Wilmington, that eight per table is a is a generous uh, layout. When they have a crowd, they boost the number of chairs up to nine, to even ten per table. They don't change the table size. I've been at some of those ten per people per table, and it's not a place I want to be for very long. So I don't recommend that. But and then the theater seating idea is is like for a a public hearing or a large, pres or even a video presentation of some kind where you're not really serving food, chairs are arranged in, in rows, and there's a, a uh, front table of, uh, of speakers, uh, and you can see the quantities, the number of people involved that, that can fit into this space. Well, why would you get less people seated in theaters seating. It seems like it would allow more. You don't have the tables. It does seem like that. I, I agree. I saw that too. And I went back to our drawings. And the, the problem is uh, aisle space and not putting so many chairs in a row that it's uncomfortable for people to, you know, mid row to, to exit or, you know, to get out. Okay. So it does generate uh, more row space. Uh, tables, you can arrange them in, in ways that you still get circulation, but it's very general across the board. So, yeah, I saw that too, and I, it didn't make sense to me, but it, when we look back at the drawings, that is what's happening. Any other questions? I'd be glad to answer anything on the building. I, I, I know the building. I don't know a lot about the rest of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. John, thank you. At this time, uh, Gary Danford will talk about our uh, demonstration of capacity. All right. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm not sure why they always pick on the retired bankers to go through pro formas and financial states and stuff. I guess it's because we looked at them for over 30 years and try to figure out uh, what worked and what didn't work. But we want to provide to you a... Um, uh, what I think is a conservative pro forma budgets. Pro formas are based, as you know, on data and assumptions. And for the purpose of this discussion, uh, the following timeline was used, uh, assuming that things would, would take off uh, now. You would be looking at uh, out, out for bid around February of 2017, potentially awarding a contract in May 
construction starting in June of 2017, furniture being ordered in August 2018, and more than likely an opening in October 2018. So you can just kind of keep those in mind, and I'll explain why that's a little bit important as you look at our fiscal stuff. This is an overview of a three different years of on the projected budget. We have every year projected out through 2025, and that information is available for you. For the purpose of the presentation, these are kind of the key years for the next five years. Um, but this view will demonstrate the impact of what the new building will do um, and the capacity that it will it will supply to support things. So if you look at the, uh, the year ending, so the year ending is June 30th. That's our fiscal year ending. So keep that in mind as we talk about year ending. It's not a calendar year, it's an actual fiscal year, which, which will come into play when we talk about the first year of operation will be a full year operation. In uh, year ending 17, that's actually based on the revenue and expenses are based on our current performance. These are actually what we have performed through the end of June of this past year, and we didn't project any additional for the following year, 2017. We kept it the same to be conservative. In the, in the next year, year ending 19, you saw on the last page we anticipate somewhere in 18, October 18, being able to open up. That way we wouldn't have a full year in 2019 year ending because it would be June 30th of 19. So you've got about a, a nine-month period there that would have some activity to get up and running. So the figures will look a little different. And then by 21, we're operating full capacity, full years. The revenue... Um, when it says stable sources, that's our current revenue. It comes from uh, operational grants, donations, um, businesses, other things such as that, our, uh, from TDA, from Coles, from Duke Energy, all those things we've been receiving on an annual basis and continue to receive. The expenses are based on our current staff and our general expenses. It also includes the payments we're currently making $75,000 each year. You can see that expenses, of course, will continue to, to grow. If you were to look at the um, 19, to give you an ex example, you'll see it's 243,300 revenue from our general operating that we've been obtaining, and our expenses are 223, so there's not a lot of difference between those two, about 20,000. The new expense that comes in would be a new staff and associated costs. New staff would be a funds development and operational officer that you would have to would have to put into place, and so that re reflects the salary of that person uh, for those years. When you come down to revenue generators net, the program revenue, building rental, and fund development items. I'm going to go over each of these on separate slides, but these are all net of expense. And then at the very bottom, you'll see that total revenue from operational revenues, operational expenses, net generators. Uh, these are our, our bottom lines for, the, for those particular years. So if you look at fund development, if you recall on the last page, there's fund development items. Fund development items are those items that include the membership programs. Membership programs are like the Institute Fellows, alumni, um, friends of Sturgeon City. They're various, uh, all of these are various fundraiser type activities. Events um, make up part of that black tie uh, events, festival, um, alumni reunions are all part of that as well. Merchandise. Merchandise is in here because merchandise can be um, and will be a part of, of revenue. Things such as sweatshirts and koozies and the type of things that have your logo on it that people want to have when they come in to visit uh, Sturgeon City. Uh, and then, of course, the capital campaigns. You can see our capital campaign has been running about 35000 a year. That's primarily from the board's capital campaign. Once ground is broke, buildings under the way, uh, all of those will be, uh, we think, very attainable um, and very conservative projection, 109500 112. If you go back to um, when things were kicking off in 2013-14, um, 
2013 and 2014, there was a tremendous amount of activity around fundraising, thinking that the building was going to get uh, started right away. Um, and so that's had to level off until we can get this settled. But we're very confident we can we can um, proceed with capital campaigns will be successful. Programming uh, was another part of those net funds. Programming revenue comes from <coughs> all of the programs and camps we currently run. The new building would significantly uh, allow us to increase the number of participants to our current programs and would add a STEM enrichment after school program for elementary and for middle school students that we currently don't have. We'd be able to implement those in full um, for the year starting 2020 and those two programs alone just having those would probably generate close or would generate close to a hundred thousand dollars just themselves. The other thing is that we we currently would be able to add at least eight more new programs with the increased size facilities. Um, we would anticipate more than 16,000 participants a year. Currently there's um, a little over about 6,000 participants. When you look at the increased capacity with the field trips, the things we're turning away today, the people we have to turn away, uh, we're very confident we can hit those numbers. Um, if you look at these numbers, the current programs, those all of these are net of expense. Um, so currently with no building, this is what it looks like for us with our programming um, after our expenses. With the expanded and current programs, once you, uh, the first year, 19, only reflects uh, just a few months because school's already started, so we can't, we can't get into the full program to the next year. But once you get into 21, by then, that revenue goes up substantially, and you're looking at about $210,000 uh, just from expanding our current programs with the building as designed. Then the rental income. In order to estimate rental income, uh, revenues and expenses, we did a survey of comparable uh, rental spaces in the area. Uh, for revenues, you can see on this slide uh, the various comps we used and the size. So if you look at these, you'll see that there's the, uh, the size of the, the facility as far as the usable space, uh, the rental costs that are associated with that particular facility, uh, the seating capacity um, for each one and what type of building it was. But these were the, uh, what we used to estimate what uh, our particular rental will be. And you'll see where that comes into play in a minute. Our building, of course, is 6,179 in square footage. And then taking the cost of what it, what it costs to run a particular um, building, we calculated the cost on each location uh, as if it were to be the size of the proposed building of the 6,179. So, uh, for instance, uh, courtyard, uh, 3,543. The cost per square foot for what they charge is, as you can see, is 56.4 cents. And if you multiply that by the 6,179 square footage, you can get the equivalent, um, the equivalent rent for for those buildings. And I say cost is actually the rental parts. If we look what's available for the building, you can estimate 180 days um, without any dramatic, dramatic impact on any of our programming. Uh, we'd likely would average at some point 80 a year. That's in a moderate range. Um, however, for our purposes, we actually reduce that to even 60 a year. You'll see in a minute for at least the first five years. Uh, the rental range runs, if you estimate all these, all the, thing, all the ones that we have compared to, run from 1,400 to 3,500. We decided to use 2,000 for estimates. That's, uh, that's exactly halfway in between, so it's a, it's a mid-range and a conservative approach. Then if you look at the uh, cost of the operations, in our cost of operations, this slide will show you various locations and we use what we use um, to make ours we actually end up using the higher again to be conservative we want to use a higher per square foot you can see the estuarium 
uh, in Washington is 12,000 square foot. <coughs> the cost of this utilities, these are all provided to us. St. James Town Hall. Um, and Mr. Alan Baker was kind enough and gave us an estimate um, from the city of what the utilities would be. And then the building um, as designed, we used uh, 295, so we had a higher one. And I'll even show you where we, we add something to that in a moment. You have to have staffing whenever you have a building. Obviously, events going. You have to have cleaning. You have to have people come in on call, and so these are uh, the estimates for for the people we need for that for each year. The deep cleaning, the the house events, um, what those costs would be, and then here's how you come up with the net rentals. So you take the rentals at the two thousand rate we discussed. You multiply those by the number of events you have. You can see that increases. 20, 40, and 60, and 21. Again, if you recall, 80 was more of a moderate number, so we actually reduced that. The gross income from those rents, what it would cost for the on-call staff per event, the maintenance and house uh, cost, and then the building operations cost. If you go back, you see I had um, 37, 731. After reviewing that even more, we added another $5,000 simply for unexpected or miscellaneous type expenses that come up, things you don't expect. So they can give a little bit more of a conservative approach. We'll make sure we have some cushion doing those as well. So those are the net of cost. So going back to the original nonprofit, it's just a summary page, but you look at it again after explaining those. and. Um, I'll be glad to entertain any particular questions. I know numbers are great to look at and fun. <clears throat> well, if not, then I'll. Uh, you said question? early on that your, one of your stable resources was funds re received from TDA. Is that something outside of the? No, from what from from <clears throat> what we're getting, what we're providing now, the the funds they provide us now. They're annual, annual yes was included in those as was the payment from Sturgeon City to uh, the 75,000 Gary on the previous slide <clears throat> when you were breaking down the revenue yes sir is two thousand dollars to go in right on a building like that that size yeah so that's probably a, that's probably a little conservative if you go back let me go back that's a great question um, yeah, so if you go back to my go back, you can see the cost of some of these here. You got six thousand at two at two thousand twenty five hundred for five thousand square foot. Then if you analyze cost per square foot, which is what we did, um, courtyard is charging fifty six cents, thirty three cents, et cetera. And so all we did was multiply multiply those costs out for the 6,100 square foot to come up with a, with a range. And that range for all those buildings came, sorry about going back and forth, range from 1,400 to 3,500. So we just took the middle road and said 2,000. Do you have any idea how many, uh, how many events the Swansboro Civic Center hosts a year? Um, I do not have that information you have it on any of um i don't have i don't have that information we, we did have that number. i mean we, we we've used that number but i don't recall what the number was but that's we where call. we well that's where the numbers for the various events um which is <coughs> I got it right 80 here. is 80 is what you the 80 and, and the, then you went to yeah. the 40 that 60 yeah and actually i did it have a uh, swansboro civic yeah. Oh, you're not sure. Number. No, but the number actually, and I've got some of that in my particular notes. Um, <clears throat> bear with me a second. So, <clears throat> I don't have the individuals in front of me, but as a summary, what I did have was. Um, the high usage ranges and how we came came about with that, and also based on conversations, you can actually look and go back to the design rent ranges and 
and maybe I should have included a slide like this, but there are uh, ranges using anywhere from a high use state to a low use times based on what we have found throughout the region. But there are also different rent ranges. And so as that goes up, also depends on, on the facility itself, how nice it is. We have uh, different use. So we have what we call high, moderate, and low use. We used a moderate, between moderate and low to make the estimation for it. So if there was, um, for instance, on the 60,000 uh, moderate use, and let me go to that so you'll see what I'm talking about. So if you go to the six to the um, 60 times, which is a, a moderate type use, that would, um, if you used a higher one, it'd be maybe 150 versus a 60 net. So it changes quite a bit between there. How much have you received in grants on an annual basis and the likelihood of those continuing in the future? Uh, I can give you some of that information too. Our current um, operation, operational grants, and that of course comes from individuals and all, and, we, and these have been continued. Um, 50, 90, basically almost 216, less 38, so <coughs> roughly around 170 some thousand. That's what we've been receiving. And these have been steady over the years? Yes, sir. In fact, we didn't even change it for the projections for the first year. If you go back to this budget, if you look at the budget here, you can even see that the stable sources, we've, we've put very little increase in that at all. The, in fact, the only increase we put was the expectation we get another 25000 from additional just people donations, not from the campaign, but people writing checks and stuff. Go back to your uh, use of the, uh, the, the number of events. You developed your low and moderate and high from actually talking to some of the folks who, who do those that those was events. the information that okay. provided to you on those. So, so. so if we just take 60 a year, that's five a month. Yep. You're basically talking about weekends. So you're, you're talking, you know, five, five days, five days out of eight potential. I mean, I know it's available during the week, but I'm just thinking about weekends, right. Fridays and yeah, Saturdays. There's, a, there's 104 weekend, weekend days yeah. in the year. And there's uh, it just it, it that just seems a lot and 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 I'm just basing it on the, I'm the treasurer of the, the the country club and just right. looking at the the usage there and and of course one of the things that happens there's only there's only so many events in a town and we're talking about taking the pie and slicing it into another another slice basically sure. yeah. which you know will reduce the opportunities for everybody I'm just. Just wondering, you know, how how good you felt about the 60 is what I, I guess where I'm my my convoluted logic is coming back to. Well, it, I guess when we look at it and chart it out, when you when you're doing these studies, you can do somewhere between 40 and 150. 150 doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Obviously, in this in this market, I felt like 60 was and Bob, a fairly I, I conservative. Like to, to say that you say you know you you you're gonna cut the pie thinner. I think that if we have a facility with this capability, it's gonna we're gonna we're gonna recruit people to come in. The country club is too small, and it's too big. And if we got if we have a facility that instead of people going to Wilmington or Newburn, local people to have events and stuff, they'll stay home. So I feel like we can have an increase. So of, no, do you uh, think the pie will be, you're going to grow the pie? The pie will be that. larger. What's the capacity? Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's all right. I'll come back. I just want the capacity for the conference center, Jacksonville Conference Center across the street. Uh, the conference center? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see if I've got that information too. I'm not sure if someone knows they can holler out at me. I may not have that with me. I'll check. 
I can tell you, I was in there the other day for United Way meeting. We had 230 people in there, and you couldn't budge. I think we were over capacity, and that was with eating. Um, not that I know if that's the official or not. Well, that's good enough. Did he say the Jackson Conference? I think the Jackson Conference, Dave Wells on that. And I think about 150 is max, and that's stop. You know, just uh, another little concern I had about the venue is it's, you know, it's a nice location for for, for water activities and, and what it's designed to do. I'm just wondering, for a nighttime venue, I just wondered if it's not a little too far off the beaten track, and that's just a, just a question. I don't know whether it is or not. Well, uh, I would be fairly <coughs> certain that at least um, Marine Corps balls were certainly wouldn't have any problem using that since today they're going to Greenville and some other yeah, areas. Well, and I, I know there's very few balls uh, that are held in, in Onslow County right now. It's true. I had a question in regards. You talked about, <clears throat> I have a couple questions. The first one is you talked about STEM programming as being one of the future goals. Do you think there's any money available from the state? Because, you know, the state supports STEM pretty, pretty heavily. Is there any opportunities that we could potentially get some funding for, for the STEM portion of that facility? That, 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 if I could just step in, sorry yes, guys. Sure. Like, I'm a little more on the ground in terms of some of the grants, and I'll definitely say there's already been, I mean, I haven't seen anything major per se in the type of dollars we're talking about, but there's already several come across my, you know, 25000 a year, 50000 a year that I feel like we almost don't fit yet because it's for redevelopment, it's for enhancement, as I've already kind of have in the back of my mind as, you know, as this moves forward is the perfect timing for some of those. And I definitely think that there is there is certainly money out there. And there's also private support. There's a lot of private support for environmental education, specifically STEM programming. Um, and so I definitely think in Onslow County, being the type of county that it is demographically, also there's a lot of funding for that area. And we are actually, um, a lot of funders are looking to expand and don't currently do a lot of funding in Onslow County. And they're looking to reach new counties. And so there are some opportunities there too. So I certainly think there would be additional sources for that. The reason I bring that up, when I sat on the Eastern Region Board, uh, I want to say it was either Goldsboro or, or Wilson, I think they got like $375,000. Um, you know, STEM is pretty huge statewide, and, and, you know, STEM programming in general is well supported. So I don't know if there may be an opportunity there to talk to, to Senator Brown or, or some other folks to to maybe get some assistance there. Wasn't our Board of Education talking about that STEM program down there a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. the shelves and yeah, I mean, it's a huge program statewide. I mean, science and math is, is huge. And, um, you know, when you talk about economic development and... and uh, uh, our, Is there a possibility of incorporating that into in terms of the classroom space? You know, one of the things that you guys talked about is a lot of events, but we can't, we shouldn't shy away from its original right. intent, so and that's an environmental education center. Absolutely, that, so if you go to the program revenue on this page, <clears throat> and you see there's 210000 in program revenue, that is from the programs such as the STEM programs and the things we do today, um, plus <clears throat> the, the additional uh, program we get. Right, so I think that Paula uh, but did a really nice job of doing some research around the original program. We already take advantage of some STEM programs today um, that we host. So we have um, the Saturday street science, the homeschool street science. Uh, those are all STEM lessons that we're using today uh, that are funded. We just don't have the capacity to go to the larger programs. Some of the things we're talking about, and Paul, you can jump in if you'd like, but the, the STEM enrichment program for elementary would be STEM lessons five times a week after school, and both for middle school and after. Yeah, that there's right? definitely been a big interest, from my understanding, and of course I'm a little newer to the project, but a big interest in having more of a real steady after school program. And with our capacity and space right now, we just can't function at that level. But that would definitely be something that we feel we could easily fill with people um, you know, especially in the middle school age group, but always in the elementary school age group. And we're doing well, you know, strong with the programs we have now, but could use more space. Well, another area that maybe could be a consideration is the, the maker portion, you know, um, uh, education and maker. Uh, 
3D printing, designing, building. You know, uh, Burlington has become a maker city, um, and they've received tons of grants. Maker, uh, a maker community is a community that does education in, um, in uh, like 3D designing and building and modeling and using science and math. It's, it's all education based and, um, and it's a huge movement, you know, obviously maybe not here, but it may be something that you can look at as an education program. And again, uh, Burlington uh, just became a maker city. And has huge support from the universities and, and several other uh, education funding sources. Uh, they teach kids how to print 3D models on 3D printers, and you know, basically utilizing the mind. Um, That's great. Two points, council members. Uh, to Councilman Lazar, there you made a point about uh, grants and all uh, or opportunities to seek those grants. Uh, the initial start of Sturgeon City allowed us to secure a Burroughs Welcome grant. Uh, Burroughs Welcome, we were on the longest funded grants, just a historical point of view. Uh, we received Burroughs Welcome money for six plus years there, had some carryover money there, which allowed us to do some of the very foundation development of programs there, our, our summer programs and after school programs. Uh, that on this novel concept of a brown water, uh, a brown stone site that has um, uh, been converted. It's a brown a chance field. To, brown field site. Brown, brown field, field site that's been converted the chance to tell that story of environmental stewardship, that was very intriguing to Burroughs Welcome, and, and they were very successful with that and all. But Council Member Bittner, you bring up a point about uh, school interest, public school interest and all. Uh, I by no means would speak on behalf of the public school, but there is interest, again, in revisiting opportunities for innovative high schools. Again, now that's, I do not speak on their behalf, but that interest is, is resurging again within the schools and all. And there is, through the work of this council, there's been site work, uh, I, and a, a sort of a welcome mat, so to speak, laid out should that opportunity uh, reappear again. And this building would serve to complement that special area of environmental education and stewardship. And then my last question was in regards to the furniture. You, someone mentioned earlier that that was a separate fund. Is that in fact a separate fund and are you guys prepared in some formal way to to furnish the facility through a different funding mechanism, or is that something that you'll be working on in the future? Well, it's always been, been the initial point laid out that we would have to assume the uh, furnishing of this building here. Okay. Yeah. One thing on the performer, which was forwarded to you last night, there was a breakout on STEM enrichment. Elementary school, five times a week, projected capacity, 38 students a cost of $150 per month. Middle school, five times a week, 38 students, projected cost of $150 a month. In both of those categories, they project an income of $114,000. What's expensive, $150 a month? Or is that, is no, that, no, they, they, actually, that's what they actually, charge, is that what they're charging? The actual cost would be um, 15000 so the net would be, about, would be um, the, the, the potential benefit is $99,000, $100,000. Yeah, the fee charged for participants, $100,000. Okay. Right, I got you. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. John? This time. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, I too want to thank everybody for the uh, session we're having. It's ironic that the reason we're here is because the, the vision of the city and the vision of, of others years ago has been successful. Sturgeon City has been successful. It's busting at the seams, and we do need additional uh, room for, uh, for growth. In 2014, a decision was made by the parties, including the city, including Sturgeon City leadership, to build a 12,970 square foot building. Um, this type of discussion took place then. Uh, you know, after all the gyrations were completed, um, we felt like, everybody felt like that large building, the 12,970 square foot building was what was needed. It was twofold. It would meet the, the growth demands of Sturgeon City um, and it would fulfill the large meeting space needed by the city. 
I don't want us to get crossed up in thinking that, you know, the country club is a large meeting space or the uh, hotels have got a large meeting space because this meeting space approaches 500. I, I called today the country club capacity was 180 if you took the dance floor out, 150 if you left it in. So we're talking about two different beasts. This is large meeting space, which, um, uh, which, which would hold quite a bit more than some of the other venues that we've talked about. But I do think it's important that we go back and, and, and remember that through the exercises in 2014, this 12,970 foot building um, was the thought process. The consensus was that's what we needed to meet the twofold needs of Sturgeon City and, and the city and the meeting space. I don't think anybody here, <clears throat> if, if money wasn't an issue, would think that the smaller building is the better choice. I think what we're, what we're struggling with and what we're discussing is the cost that's been really associated with inflation, which was at 400 and I believe it was 59,000 or something in that range. And so, so the issue is really the, the difference in the cost today and what it was in 2014. And again, I want to remember that the reason that we didn't start building in 2014 was because of the decision to reclaim, to, to do the very thing that Sturgeon City has set out to do, is to build on a reclaimed uh, brownfill site. So not only do you have the story of the river, but you now got a second success story of the uh, building on the brownfield site. Um, and that's the reason, don't lose sight, that's the reason for the delay. Uh, if, it, if, the, if the choice had been made to build elsewhere, you wouldn't have had the delay, the building would have been built and we're up and running and, um, and moving forward. But that delay and that inflationary figure that we're talking about tonight is because of the decision to build on the brownfield site that was contaminated by the city years ago, and thank goodness it's been cleaned up and we're in a position to, to move forward. Sturgeon City's board clearly believes, I mean, we've had a lot of discussion. We clearly believe that, the, that we need to stay on course with that decision that was made in 2014. Nothing significantly has changed. Uh, we're still growing. We've still got growing pains. The city still doesn't have large meeting space capacity. Um, through our research with the, with the hotels that have been built, that are going to be built, nobody's got space coming on board like this. Um, and so nothing has changed that we believe in our original thought, all of our original thought processes that occurred back in uh, uh, 2014. It's almost difficult to understand. We've had 44,000 kids, youth, Paul, 44,000 that has passed through the doors of Sturgeon City since inception. I mean, think about it. That's a lot of activity. Um, uh, and that's coupled with the fact that we're having, we're, we're turning down students. We've got, we've got kids that are asking for additional educational opportunities and they can't get them because that's Sturgeon City because we just don't have the room to, to do that. So, you know, we do need, we do need more space. And like I said, it is twofold. Um, you know, the, the story behind the Sturgeon City, let me remind, remind everybody, a, a river that was contaminated by the city in the area, a river uh, that the city took responsibility. And the base. And the base. Well, I didn't want to call names, but in others. <laughs> um, you know, that, uh, that took responsibility. I mean, you know, this is our issue. You know, we're, we're part, partially responsible, and it's our issue, and we're going to clean this thing up, and it occurred. And that is, a, that is a story that needs to be told over and over and over again. And, um, you know, when people walk into that building, when kids go through those programs, and when adults walk into a building that's going to be built there, you know, they, they can't help but see the pictures and read the etchings on the wall and see the photographs of, of this story. And I, we, we really believe it is a story that needs to be told to a lot of people. Um, not only to the to staff members and the students there. Um, an interesting little bit of information, 70% of the Sturgeon City students who participated in our science projects at Sturgeon City and who subsequently went on to get a degree from university, 70% got a degree in some sort of science, uh, science uh, avenue. So that's, I think that uh, that's really beginning to give us a story on what this is all about. Um, 
we don't think the 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 right course is to shrink the building um we, we feel like it's going to be used it's going to help tell the story even further we don't think this is a city of jacksonville project we think this is, is going to be used more from a regional uh perspectives uh the reason we're not, I can tell you, when I was in the banking world, I would have calls a year helping people find venues that could that could hold large crowds. And the reason we're not having those is because we can't have them. We don't have anywhere to put them. And so the numbers at the country club are, are Bob, are not uh, not as high as they could be because the space is too small. And it's just something that uh, in Jacksonville we really don't have the experience in holding the large uh, meetings because we don't have the space. Um, we've got some real life examples here in town of, of projects that we've, uh, we've dealt with, um, you know, that we, 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 we started out doing the right things and then we changed because of budget constraints. And, uh, I'm too a member of the country club and we, when, when we, when we talked about building the country club, we talked about having facilities that could handle the larger meetings and gatherings it didn't occur i mean the, the the finances were an issue so we scaled it back and now we're sort of in a mid-tier situation with a facility that'll hold 180 people at, at max if you remove the remove the dance floor it's a great facility it's used by a lot of people but is it meeting the need in the community for larger space the answer is it is not Jacksonville Commons, another great facility. I mean, it's like a like a bee's nest, you know, during the day. So it, it clearly is serving the the uh, 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 tremendous purpose. Um, economics got involved. It, uh, it had to be cut back. So locker rooms were taken out of play. Locker room and some of the storage, and so uh, events that require the changing of uniforms and changing clothes and showering can't be held there. Uh, because there's just no there's no locker rooms and so those events are going elsewhere so those are two examples that we can look at we can feel um, they're right here but let's not let's not forget that if we um, cutting of the budgets on both of those projects had impact on both of those projects not saying they're bad projects without it I'm just saying it had impact on those let's just remember uh, the impact that that scaling back can uh, can have on it um, the, the larger space will be used both by Sturgeon City. This is not just a uh, larger space for the community meeting rooms. I mean, Sturgeon City is going to use that space. You know, unfortunately, the, the weather, it rains, and we've got to have indoor activities. We, you know, we want to have larger events. We want to have competitions. And so Sur Sturgeon City certainly needs that space as well. The space will provide for close to 500 people. We do feel like that space... Uh, when it's not being used by Sturgeon City, will be available for rental. We do think that the income that will be generated from that space will, will cover the, uh, will go a long way in covering the additional expense of that. <clears throat> we do, this, this, the Board of Sturgeon City certainly understands that the city is not a bank. Um, Sturgeon City has paid $300,000 already on the debt. Tourism has paid $600,000 towards the debt, and the city has paid $388,000 towards the note. Um, so we understand that the city is not a bank. We understand that we're partners, and we want to continue with that. Um, we believe our projections. We, we have studied our projections tremendously. We believe those projections, and we believe we're going to be in a position to, to help repay the, the inflationary dollars that it's cost. Uh, and um, you know the board is willing to do that now can i give you exact dollar what we can do i can't because we don't know what that is but i will tell you based on our projections which we think are, uh, are good projections the board is more than willing to step forward and agree to pay towards that that, that overage so we're we're in this we're not expecting the city just to put the money out there we're in this we just want the city to help all of us get to where we think we need to be Certainly have other partners that are excited about the project. Counties contributed two hundred one thousand uh, already. We've had multiple other contributors contributing two hundred sixty-seven thousand. Uh, the state legislation has already set aside one hundred fifty thousand dollars to help towards the parking lot expense. Um, thanks to to Representative Shepard and our other representatives in Raleigh, 
So, I mean, a, a lot of commitments, a lot of money, non-city money has been brought to the table, and we, we continue to want to utilize that. So I guess the bottom line where, where the, our board is coming from is that a decision was made in 2014. We all believed at that point that the larger facility was needed for two reasons, for the growth of Sturgeon City and for the large meeting space for the city. And we still stand by that decision, and we hope that decision made in 2014 was the right one. Um, and that decision was made, taking into consideration financial responsibility. And nothing has changed materially since that decision was made. We still have growth pains, and the city still lacks large meeting space capacity. You know, we want to see this through. <clears throat> Gary's presentation shows that there's uh, capacity for us to participate at a greater degree. Um, we are asking the city to let's move forward with the with the larger building, keeping in mind the region. The reason we have that inflationary increase is because we're dealing with the brownfield site that was created through contaminated soil created by the city in the earlier earlier years. So if you would just keep all that in mind, and we hope that uh, that we can move forward with this. It is a whopping success story, and we want everybody that can see it to see it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. A question in regards to what you said earlier, Brown, the Brownfield site. What did you receive on that? How much did you receive on that grant? With the early days, we received some support through uh, uh, Smithfield. Um, uh, I don't have those numbers with me, uh, Council Member, but um, early days, the um, part of a Smithfield settlement from this the, was some time ago. Yes, sir. Because, you know, the Department of Commerce, and I hate to keep bringing all this stuff up, but this is stuff that I hear, and they have a brownfield program through the Department of Commerce that also does uh, grant funding if you take brownfield sites, claim them as brownfield sites. As long as they're certified, you can get money for that. And, I mean, this is recent stuff. Now, I don't know whether we qualify or whether it's official, I'm just throwing stuff out there that may be of help. Well, I, I um, think that when you look back at the at the pro forma, one of the one of the things in there was that new position that has to come into play, which is a fund development position, and operational manager, someone they can focus on 100% of their time on on operations and fund development. Right now, Paula does a great job, but Paula has to run everything else too. I understand. And so, it's a it's a bit difficult to, uh, from a time perspective on that. But I do agree with you. There's I think there are more and more opportunities that we're not even aware of. I do have a question for John, if you don't mind. Sure. When we're talking about the cost, you know, we were able to build a public safety building of nine, 90,000 square feet plus. Um, in relation to the cost of this and the size of this building. How does it differ? Because when we look at the expense of that building versus this building, it seems like there's a there's a differential in cost. Right. And what, what's causing that? Because that's where I'm having my personal difficulty is trying to understand how a 12,000 square foot building has that enormous cost. Uh, a, a big fifty-one dollars a square foot of the total cost of the, you know, the cost per square foot is tied up in site work. There's a significant... But we had significant site work at the public safety building. Yeah. Um, I think the... Let me answer that just a second, see if you agree. Yeah. It's a different type of construction. The Center for Public Safety is basically building floor after floor after floor that's, that's structurally supported. Here, you're building a building that's very similar to a gymnasium has a tremendous amount of open space, therefore it has very little interior support columns. I think Mr. Warden in his cost estimate would tell you that one type of construction may cost you $175 a square foot. You get into this type for a gymnasium, you can easily be up into $300 plus a square foot. Would you agree with that or yeah. not? Yeah, well, the other thing that's happening, this building has a lot of flexibility built in. It, it has to have in order for it to serve for classroom space and serve this large meeting space. So, for example, um, if, if we just had, if the building was just one big room, 
you know, and, and it was always set up that way for a large banquet. We could heat and cool that with maybe two HVAC systems. What we have designed is the building can be, that large space can be designed, div divided into thirds. Each of those spaces has two HVAC systems. The lighting is the same way. There's so much flexibility built in. There are walls, there are other walls in the building that pull back, barn doors that pull back to reveal the teaching sinks, carts, those kind of things that are needed for STEM education, those are hidden away when the facility is a, is a banquet. So when you build in that much flexibility That's in a building, it runs the cost up. I, I want to say quickly, I'm not satisfied with the cost. Yeah. It's high. <laughs> <laughs> and we are looking for ways to reduce that because uh, we do classroom buildings all the time. We do gyms, we do other buildings, and the cost per square foot on this building exceeds the other projects we've done. And we are searching for where is this cost? Because uh, I would like nothing better than to find some smoking gun, <laughs> but we, you know, it's spread all over the place. And I, I, I know that, you know, a big reason is all that flexibility. But it needs that kind of flexibility to serve these multiple functions. Thank you. Don? Uh, question. The, uh, the, the shortfall of 459 right now, Yeah. is that factoring in the 150000 for paving from, from the state legislature? I, I think the available... I think the available in the project fund number, I believe, has $150,000, but I'm not sure about that. Do you have the exact yeah, number? I'm also, I that I'm also see this. Anthony Thank has been working with the DOT on that. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to actually include that in the project because of the way the DOT funds things. So I just don't say that you're not going to get the $150,000. Let's also say you are going to get the $150,000. Representative Shepard is to be commended for trying to assist. But the problem is the DOT is not going to turn over to the city $150,000 to be part of the project. To do the paving, they would require us to go through their bidding and procurement process. So let's just say that $150,000 is in limbo. What is the real number? Is, is the number that he's talking about the same as your number? The 400 deficit? Uh, no, I, I yeah. believe the deficit is larger, but you know, the deficit can move up and down depending on what you add in or out. Okay. And, and the 459 is not with the reduced height right. at this point. Right. It's not. At this time, I'm going to let Charles Eford give our closing remarks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'm about ready to get this thing closed out. Thank you for letting us meet with y'all today. And the council always has a lot of tough decisions to make about about the money. The money for this project could be used for a lot of other projects that y'all have on the table. If we had not run into the ground issues. We would not be here today. The building would have already been built and on target with funds. And it has not, it just has not worked out. And it's not anybody's fault. It just is what it is. The city has done a great job of cleaning up the appearance of Jacksonville and making the quality of life issues much, much better. My grandsons love to go to the splash park and play. I mean, they, they love it. The new boat landing is incredible. And it is it's extensively used by boaters and fishermen. You know, I mean, when you go by there, I mean, you especially on weekends. I mean, it is incredible. When you come into our city 
And you see how beautiful it is? And we all saw what it looked like before that old dilapidated building. It makes me proud. Then going across that new bridge. I mean, we have done great things. We really have. But because the new river is as clean as, as, as it has ever been, there's abundance of wildlife, and it's one of the best fishing areas in eastern North Carolina. Fishermen come from all over the state and other states to fish on the new river. 25 years ago, the river was dead because of the city's wastewater going in there and the base, and it killed the water. Myself, Sammy, Bob, Jerome, Randy, we remember that. I mean, we used to couldn't even go in the river. I mean, they'd say, stay out of the river. You know, it was that bad. In 1999, the city decided to do something about it, and it worked. This method of cleaning the water had never been tried before, but it worked. The city decided to make the old sewer plant a monument to remind the people of what happened and how we cleaned it up. Sturgeon City was born. Four million dollars was dedicated to this project in 1999 to tell this story and to educate our young people not to make this mistake again. The council incentive funds was created by raising taxes to, to fund this project. We're trying to build this building for two purposes. One, to make Surgeon City a destination for not only Oslo County students, but for Eastern North Carolina. Uh, when Judy graduated from East Carolina, she did her student teaching. And she was student teaching in Greene County. She calls me up and she said, Dad, you're not gonna believe where I'm going tomorrow. I said, where are you going? She said, I'm taking my class and we're going to Mike's farm. I went, Mike's farm? She said, yeah. Teachers and educators are looking for a destination that they can go and they got two hours to get there and two hours to get home. And in the meantime, you pack them full of things that stimulate them. Math and science is what we're going after. Because, Lord, we need as much of that as we can. And you can look at the, at, at, at the statistics that, we, that our students that, that go through Sturgeon City, they're, they're really interested in this. And so this is why I, I guess I'm so passionate about wanting to get this facility built, get it going. We just want to encourage our young people in the math and science, how math and science is good and how it helps our environment. We also want to build a facility that can handle a Marine Corps ball, a junior senior prom, a big wedding reception, or a big conference. The, I think a perfect example is, is our real estate. I mean, our, our, our realtors in, in Onslow County. There's not a facility large enough for them to have great big meetings, you know. And, I am sure that they will use this facility once it's built. Like the river landing and the common areas and splash park, we want this facility to make us all proud of what we're doing in Jacksonville and making it a better place to live and to raise our children and grandchildren. Please try to help us with this dream and remember what has been said in the past it is morally the right thing to do. And also remember the idea of the STEM high school is still very much alive, more so now than it has been in the last couple of years. If we can get that high school here, those students that go to that high school when they graduate will have two years of college credits can you imagine how much money that's going to save a mama and a daddy that are trying to want to get their children educated? This STEM, this STEM high school is very important. And I do think that we have a good possibility 
of being able to land this. We we were that close to getting it already, and uh, but you know how politics can be. But uh, I do want to say, and John mentioned it, we with with our performer and our projections and stuff, we are going to have money available at some point to help repay the additional funding that we need to build this building. And we we are committed in to helping to pay that that money, that additional money that we are asking for. And we just hope that, you know, that we can come up with a way that we can do this and get this done. And let's go ahead and get this project going. I mean, if you'd have told me that we would be this far off schedule because of something in the ground, you know, uh, it, I'd say you're crazy, but uh, it did, and it has. But it, that we're ready to go now. And with your help, we can make it work. Thank you for your time and your service. Mayor, I have about 10 minutes of additional thoughts that I'd like to share with you. Uh, if you don't mind, since this is the only agenda item, we can keep on that. Is that acceptable? You know, one of the nice things about being the manager is that uh, I really don't have to worry about a lot of the things y'all have to worry about. You know, my job is to give you facts and to try to give you recommendations. The difficult task comes down to you. The other part is, as I said, in moving a community forward, we need to decide, you know, what can we do? When can we do it? What are our priorities? As has been said many times, the private sector, since this project started, we had some of these that are listed here, like the Country Club and the Armory. There are others that aren't listed, but there are facilities that have come online. Part of the discussion you have to think, or part of the decision has to be, are we gonna to continue to grow? How many balls can we attract? Can we enlarge the pie? Or if we don't enlarge the pie, what's the impact on the other people who are currently slicing the pie? There's no question all options have physical challenges and pros and cons. One of the things we need to decide is what's the mission, actual needs, versus what are our desires. And then the question is, how much risk do you as a council, do I as your city manager feel comfortable with on shortfalls? Because while the performer has a lot of good material in it, I would also remind you, as Gary said, it's a performer. It's based upon data, it's based upon assumptions. The problem with assumptions is you know what that means sometimes. I won't say it since we're on TV. But you have to be careful in the assumptions. And what we have to remember is this, any shortfall falls on us. It falls on the city taxpayer. Havelock is just up the road. It has marine balls. It has a center that, in my opinion, is, uh, is exceptional in the thought process because they combined a military museum with a conference center. Wouldn't it be great if we could combine the museum for the marine or something like that with a conference center built in one place so that when you come for a conference, you actually get to witness the history of the city rather than spending $20 million over there and $5 million someplace else. And I'm not against the Museum of the Marine. I'm just saying Havelock did it right. Havelock's facility may not have the level of, um, of architectural design that ours has. These are actual statistics from their manager and from the person who runs their center. They can seat 700, they can seat 500 in a banquet. The operating cost each year is $419,000. That includes $40,000 for electricity. They have 200 rentals a year. The large scale rentals though are only about 50. So when this performer says that you're looking at, you know, 40, 50, 60 large events, 
that's pretty much what Havelock is seeing. And they charge a thousand dollars an event. Now you could double your money by charging two thousand like the performer shows. And you have to decide, will the market bear that? A mid-scale event means that every that the entire area is cut in half. This past year they had 77 of those, and they charged $500 per. With all of the income, and I have to admit, they don't have the programmatic things that Paula would bring to this program, the city still subsidizes that building. And it's paid for, right? I actually don't know whether it's paid for. I did not, I did not ask operating that. Cost, yeah. it, it could be in the operating cost. Mm -hmm. Large-scale event, they take about four hours to set up with four personnel. That's one full-time and three part-time. They have roughly four hours to clean up. That's four personnel, one full-time, three part-time. Mid-scale event, you can see the, the numbers there. The Council Initiative Fund was established, as you know, to build capital projects. Currently, that four cents brings in right at $1.4 million. Over the next several years, a lot of that that is obligated will be declining. For example, in, two, in FY17, there's roughly $1 million obligated out of the 1.4. Two years away, City Hall and Jacksonville Landing will be paid in full. And your obligation will drop down to 667000 So in my math, which Gail doesn't let me do in public, remember, you're going to have roughly half of your money obligated and half of the money unobligated. Even better news is that in FY19, the public safety complex will be paid in full. And out of your 1.4 million annually, assuming that the tax base doesn't grow, you will only have 173,000 obligated. And by FY20, you'll be down to 118. From one standpoint, you can look at this and say, well, in that case, we can build anything we want. We're going to have the money. The current general fund, I want everybody to make sure they understand this. When we adopted the budget for FY17, we added to the Sturgeon City Project $721,000. Why? Because your budgeting policy says you cannot put anything in the budget that's going to cost money unless you find a revenue source for it. This money is there, and yes, you can direct it to the project. The money is also there as a placeholder. You'll recall in the budget, we told you we were putting it in there, and you told us, fine, it's a placeholder, but it's not a commitment of the city council to actually spend it at that time. In this year's budget, we have $100,000 for Richard Ray Park. That money does not come from the four cents. It comes from the sale of the property to Marine Chevrolet and that is to finish some of the additional things if the rain ever quits and we're able to dry the site out. Northeast Creek Park, 340,000, primarily for restrooms and upgrades. And as you know, we could easily spend a million dollars at Northeast Creek Park this year, and it needs it. Riverwalk Park Marina, 350,000, to match the 350 that we've already gotten from Pardaf, and hopefully another 200,000 from CAMA. Rails to trails, 25,000. These are the unfunded capital projects. And you can go back to your book and you can actually <laughs> see the details. In 2000, in FY18, you have 11 projects currently unfunded because they're not in the budget year. The total of that is 2.1 million. In 19, there are 11 projects at 2.7 million. In 20, there are five projects at 1.2 million. In 21, there are two projects at 800,000. Altogether, your five-year CIP in the four years of unfunded projects, 29 projects at $7 million. 
that doesn't mean you have to do those projects. It just means that's currently in the CIP. And then if you wanted to do additional things, the good news is there are two additional splash pads in there. But if we're going to do any other items that aren't in there, that would add to it. Option one and option two, utility power. I didn't realize that they were going to cover this, so I won't spend a lot of time. But obviously, even at $2.30, and as you saw from uh, John's pro former, it was $2.80 or $0.90. Cents. And then you add the minimum water and sewer, it does cost to operate. Furniture and fixtures, $200,000 to $300,000. Somebody has to come up with that, because building a building and not furnishing it means you're not going to be able to rent it. You have to decide if the pro forma doesn't work, are you ready to have an operating subsidy? Because the operating subsidy is not going to come from the four cents. The operating su subsidy will come from your general fund money. And I would remind you how tight the general fund money is getting as the growth in this community continues, but at a slower pace. I think there's some applicable questions that we all need to think of. And I will say to you that as the manager, one of the nice things that I get, again, is you can fire me. The nice thing about being your manager is I get to tell you bluntly what I think. And you get to tell me bluntly whether you agree, whether you want me to pack my bags, or whether you want me to do something else. So here are the questions that I pose to you. As you face this issue, what's the true mission of Sturgeon City? Is the mission education or is the mission the Civic Center? What option best fulfills that mission? What's in the best interest of the city taxpayers? What are the priorities of our citizens? And what is a need versus a desire? Here are my recommendations, and all they are is recommendations. I strongly support Sturgeon City because I can tell you as a country, and you know that I ran an engineering firm for a long time, there are 600,000 engineers being graduated from schools in China. There's not even a hundredth of that being graduated in United States universities. As a community, we need to do everything we can to encourage people to get into engineering science. I applaud what Paula and them are proposing to do. That can be accomplished through classrooms. You don't have to build a large building. You can build classrooms. As you saw in the options before, that option said build one science classroom at 1,500 square feet and three other classrooms at 1,200 square feet. Build them all at 1,500 square feet if you want. Yeah. But what you're looking at is a $1.25 million cost. And that's using numbers that have been obtained from the state, about $175 a square. If you do that, you have fulfilled, in my opinion, maybe not in their opinion, the real mission of Sturgeon City, and you have fulfilled your pledge to Sturgeon City, and I think you have filled your obligation to spend their $75,000 a year appropriately. <clears throat> You need to have discussions with the TDA because if you don't build a big building, you are going to have to say, how do we fulfill our pledge to the TDA or do we pay it back? So what you could do is take the $721,000 that's in your budget this year and you could pay back to the TDA the $600,000 that they have put in. And then in the third part of the recommendation is you could use the excess funds to pay down the debt. Because guess what? This doesn't make the debt go away. It only transfers who's paying the annual payment. Well, if you take the general balance 
of, you know, let's just say uh, $2.4 million. And instead of having TDA give you 150000 a year, you have to take it out of your own funding. You can divide 150000 into what's left after building the classrooms. And guess what? The existing funds will pay down 15 years of that $150,000 balance. So you're not having to tap the general fund for that money you're losing from TDA. It will balance out. In the end, the recommendation would accomplish the number one mission of Sturgeon City, and that's education. Now, do we want a civic center in this community? And can this community afford it? If you don't like this recommendation, I'm going to give you one that you probably don't like any better. And that's this one. If you think the full facility should be built, I ask you to consider, is this the location to build it? It may be the location for Sturgeon City, but if you're building a civic center or a conference center or a place that has balls, is that the location? Fifteen years ago, your predecessors bought Angelo Insight. And the goal was to build a civic center with a complimentary hotel. I will say to you this. If you ever build this facility at Sturgeon City, you will never need to build and you never should build a facility on Onslow Inn. Why? Because you're suddenly competing against yourself. You're going to build a civic center on Onslow Inn that's going to compete with the same type of capacity that you have down in Sturgeon City? That's just bad management. Bad business. So I would say to you, if you're going to build a full facility, you should build it on the Onslow Inn site, in my opinion, and you should then go after a hotel to be constructed next door to it. In talking to the people at Havelock, what they have said is military balls like their center for this reason. And pardon the bluntness. You can drink and walk to a hotel room. You don't have to get in your car and drive. Why is it that so many balls go to Newburn? because of the space, because of the beauty of the water, but also because you can drink and walk to hotels. And anybody who, who values their military career knows that one thing you don't want is to get a DUI. In the end, what I want everybody, including the Sturgeon City Board, to understand is this. I strongly support the mission of Sturgeon City. I think we have to ask the question, though, what is that mission? And I will say to you, I don't envy the decision you're going to have to make. I also want to make sure you understand this. The decision should never be made about, well, I want to support the manager or I want to start the certain city board. Fine. It, does, it won't bother me at all. The sun's going to come up in my life tomorrow if you vote to, to build it down there. I just hope we all remember, though, that in the end, our responsibility is to put aside any loyalty we have to anyone else. My loyalty is first and foremost to you and to the taxpayers. Your loyalty is first and foremost to whom? The voters and taxpayers. And I don't envy the decision you make. I would also encourage you to do this. I think that you as a council should have another workshop where there are no presentations by me or Surgeon City or anybody, and you have the opportunity for an hour or two to sit around and really talk about everything that you've heard over the last couple of months. This is not an insignificant decision, as you know. And I would encourage you to have a third workshop with the bounds set that nobody is to talk unless asked for except the seven of you. Thank you for the courtesy you give me. All right, Council, uh, any discussion? Questions? Is there any? 
tourism has found the justification to fund a significant share of this project, correct? Yes, sir. Has any overture has been made to the county tourism people? Not that has been made through the city manager's office. Maybe overtures have been made through other sources. <clears throat> Let me ask a question I think I have the answer to. The contamination at the, uh, at the Sturgeon City site was under property, under the ownership of the Water and Sewer Fund, or under the general ownership of the city? I believe it's generally under the ownership of the Water and Sewer Fund because that site was purchased, but John could give you a more historic answer, not because he's older than I am, but because he's been here longer. So conceivably, there, some of the money for restora restoration could come from, for example, the Water and Sewer Fund, for example, uh, money from the sale of timber or so on, excess revenue. Well, I think the answer to your question is, you, you can use, I believe that you can use the, Sturgeon, the uh, money from the water and sewer fund to do anything relative to cleaning up that site. It could not be used to help fund this building. But some of the costs attributable to this building are because, is because of the contamination. I don't believe that that's the case. I believe the contamination has held up the project, but there isn't anything it's, it's elevation changes, but that's something we could look into. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Sure. Do you want to, uh, as a yes. council, to get together yes. and uh, yes. talk yes. this over? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and schedule another, on another <clears throat> workshop at a later date for a council to discuss, only the council. Yes. To discuss. All right, motion to adjourn. Yes. Says. Anybody want a second? All in favor? All right. All right. Yeah, a few minutes to uh, grab a snack.